Good afternoon. During today's legislative hearing, we will consider three bills. S4104, the Wallapai Tribal Water Rights Settlement Act of 2022. S4439, the Katamain and Amikiatam Sacred Lands Act and HR5221, Urban Indian Health Confer Act. S4134, introduced by Senators Sinema and Kelly, would authorize and ratify the Wallapai Tribe Water Rights Settlement Agreement between the tribe, certain allottees, and the state of Arizona, and would transfer certain lands into trust for their benefit. H.R. 5221, passed by the House in November last year, would require the Department of Health and Human Service Services to confer with urban Indian organizations or UIOs on matters impacting health care for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. I'll note that Senator Smith and Langford introduced an identical Senate companion bill in May. Lastly, Senator Padilla's bill, S4439, would transfer approximately 1,031 acres from the U.S. Forest Service to the Department of Interior to be placed into trust for the benefit of the Karuk tribe to allow for traditional and customary uses. Before I turn to Vice Chair Murkowski, I'd like to extend my welcome and thanks to our witnesses for joining us today, and I look forward to your testimony and discussion. Uh, Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the hearing today on these three bills. I think you have, have uh, detailed them appropriately. Um, just with regards to the legislation sponsored by Senators Sinema and Kelly, S4104, um, I think it is important to, to recognize that this settlement is a decade in the making, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about the details. We know that settling water rights through negotiated settlements approved by Congress continues to be the best way to deliver wet water to tribes. I am pleased that we were able to include in our bipartisan infrastructure law $2.5 billion in an Indian water rights settlement completion fund to fulfill the federal government's commitments to our tribes for congressionally approved water rights. So it's good, good to see how this is playing out. With regards to S4439, introduced by Senators Padilla and Feinstein, um, I, would, I would note that uh, while the Department of Interior is, is intending to testify in support of taking this land into trust for the tribes, I do think it would be prudent, Mr. Chairman, uh, that the committee also received testimony from the Forest Service, particularly on what impacts this bill may have on their current administration of these lands and waters. And I would suggest that the committee seek the testimony in writing as we continue to consider this bill. And then with the legislation sponsored by Congressman Grijalva, uh, I would note that uh, Senators Lankford and Smith are co-sponsoring an identical Senate companion while we have no uh, UIOs in Alaska, it is my understanding that these organizations in the lower 48 have found the confer process with IHS to be beneficial with regard to providing health care services to American Indians and Alaska Natives living in our urban areas. So I'm interested in learning how this confer process may help address other important health-related issues, too, uh, as well as the missing, murdered Indigenous peoples crisis. So look forward to the testimony and hearing from our witnesses. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair. We'll turn to our witnesses. Uh, first, we have Mr. Jason Freihagi, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Management of the Office of the Assistant Secretary Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. Mr. Benjamin Smith, Deputy Director of the Indian Health Service, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And I'd uh, now like to introduce Senator Sinema to introduce uh, her um, guest and testifier. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski. I'm honored to speak about the importance of the Wallapai Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act of 2022, legislation that I've introduced with my colleague, Senator Mark Kelly. Our legislation provides long-term stability to the Wallapai Tribe's water needs in northern Arizona, which is especially important as Arizona and the Southwest face historic drought conditions. Our legislation is the result of collaboration between the state of Arizona, the Wallapai Tribe, and the Department of the Interior, and it has broad support among Arizona water stakeholders, including Mojave County, Salt River Project, the Arizona Department of Water Resources, the Central Arizona Water Conservation District, and Freeport McMoran. Currently, the Wallapai Tribe relies on groundwater alone to meet their water needs, which in today's climate and with our forecasted water future is not a permanent or sustainable solution. 
The Wallapai Tribe Water Settlements Right Act will provide the tribe a permanent allocation of Colorado River water and the funding to construct the infrastructure needed to deliver that water from the Colorado to the tribe's main residential and commercial centers, Grand Canyon West and Peach Springs, Arizona. I now have the incredible honor to introduce the chairman of the Wallapai Tribe, Dr. Damon Clark, who will be able to explain the legislation in further detail and how it will benefit the tribe in Arizona. Chairman, thank you for being here today. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Sinema. Uh, now we have uh, Senator Padilla to introduce uh, his guest and uh, explain his legislation. Thank you, uh, Chair Schatz and Ranking Member Murkowski, for allowing me to join you today to introduce Russell Atterbury, Chairman of the Karuk Tribe in California. Uh, it's an honor to introduce Chairman Atterbury, who is here virtually, uh, to testify on a bill that uh, I'm leading with uh, Senator Feinstein in this House and Congressman Huffman on the House side that will transfer 1,000 acres of sacred lands from the Forest Service to the Interior Department to place those lands into trust for the tribe. Now, the lands covered by this bill are considered to be the center of the Karuk world and sit at the heart of the tribe's culture, religion, and identity. Chairman Atterbury is currently serving in his third consecutive term as chairman and has been a key leader in championing this effort. During his 11 years as chairman, he's also served on the Department of Interior's Tribal Interior Budget Council, the Executive Council of the California Tribal Chairmen's Association, and was recently selected as one of the seven primary tribal representatives to the Department of Interior's Progress Act negotiated rulemaking committee. Chairman Atterbury was also appointed by Governor Jerry Brown to the California Native American Heritage Commission. Before serving as chairman, Mr. Atterbury worked for the Reading and Siskiyou School Districts, and he holds a lifetime clear teaching credential from Humboldt State University. Now, the Karuk tribe have lived and conducted ceremonies on the sacred lands known as Katamane for centuries. These sacred lands, which are used for the tribe's world renewal ceremony, represent the center of the Karuk world and serve as an integral part of tribal culture, religion, and identity. Currently, 95% of the Karuk Aboriginal territory is managed by the federal government, and the tribe has a special use permit from the Forest Service to access the land for prayers and ancestral ceremonies. However, in recent years, the tribe has struggled to access the site and conduct their sacred ceremonies privately, without interruption. So it's a moral imperative to restore these lands to tribal ownership. Placing these lands in trust would allow the Karuk to further their mission, to enhance and restore the natural world, and allow them to preserve their traditional practices. I thank Senator Feinstein for introducing this legislation with me in the Senate, and Congressman Huffman for championing this effort in the House. I also want to thank Chairman Atterbury for his testimony today and for his leadership in working to advance the long overdue effort. His approach to the federal tribal relationship has been one that says collaboration is always the best first step in building partnerships, and his testimony today is a testament to that. Look forward to working with my colleagues to enact this bill as quickly as possible and return these sacred lands to their original stewards. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Padilla. Now uh, I'd like to um, turn it over to Senator Smith to introduce uh, her guest. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair uh, Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski for holding this hearing today and for including the Urban Indian Health Confer Act. Senator Lankford and I um, introduced the Senate version of this bill, which would require every agency within the Department of Health and Human Services to confer with urban Indian organizations when policies affect health care for urban Native communities. This measure is an important step towards parity for urban Native communities and something that I think we should all be able to agree on. So I look forward to working with the committee to get this bill across the finish line this year. To help us understand the impact of this bill, I'm very glad to welcome Dr. Patrick Rock, Chief Executive Officer of the Indian Health Board of Minneapolis and a member of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Dr. Rock is a family physician um, and has been serving patients at IHB for over 25 years. He is a tireless advocate for the urban indigenous community in Minneapolis and his leadership has helped IHB grow into the distinguished institution that it is today. I recently had a chance to visit the Indian Health Board to hear about their work on mental health, reproductive care, 
and comprehensive health services for urban indigenous Minnesotans. Under Dr. Rock's leadership, they're also working on an expansion that will expand their capacity and incorporate indigenous cultural components into the facility. So I'm very proud to work on behalf of the Indian Health Board and Minnesota's urban indigenous communities um, here in Washington on this bill, and I hope to see us move this forward and get it done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, and to Senator Langford for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks for the time on us, and thanks for taking up this bill as you work through this. I I'd like to first start off by saying thank you uh, to the leadership and to the individuals that serve in the two Oklahoma Urban Indian Clinics clinics in Tulsa and in Oklahoma City for their continued service to the urban Indian population. Uh, Oklahoma urban Indian clinics serve the second largest population next to California, and uh, Senator Padilla I know, knows we're right behind him on that one, uh, but uh, leaders like Robin uh, Sunday Allen and Carmelita Skeeter uh, in Tulsa and in Oklahoma City, they're the reason that all this works so well. Uh, they work incredibly hard and they are absolutely the gold standard for healthcare and clinic operations. Uh, I was proud to sponsor and help pass into law two urban Indian clinic uh, focused bills with S Senator Smith. Uh, we helped pass the Coverage for Urban Indian Health Providers Act and the Facilities Improvement Act, both ensure greater parities for UIOs in the Indian health system. Both bills were the first ever standalone UIO bills passed in Congress. Uh, so it's a big deal. We're continuing to be able to build on that. I'm proud to be able to co-sponsor with Senator Smith. Uh, the uh, Senate Companion the Urban Indian Health Confer Act. This simple legislation uh, will ensure the UIOs are brought into important conversations and confer at HHS. We talk a lot about consultation with tribes, but currently HHS is not doing consultation with our urban Indian clinics, and that needs to start. Uh, so we'd like to be able to bring that into line right now on that. I look forward to the full consideration, quick passage of the bill in this committee. We have a lot more to do to be able to bring parity to UIOs, and this is another really important step. And I thank the chairman and ranking member for bringing this to the attention today. Thank you very much. Uh, and we welcome all of our testifiers and thank all the members for their leadership. Uh, I want to remind our witnesses that your full written testimony will be made part of the official hearing record. Please keep your statement to no more than five minutes. Um, so that members may have time for questions. Uh, Mr. Freihage, you may begin. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee. My name is Jason Freihage, and I serve as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Management for Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Department's testimony on S-4104, the Wallapai Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act of 2022, and S-4439, the Katamine and Amikiatam Sacred Lands Act. The Biden administration strongly supports the resolution of Indian water rights claims through negotiated settlements. Congress plays an important role in improving water rights settlements, and we stand ready to work with this committee and the members of Congress. Negotiations regarding potential settlement of the tribe's water right claims have been ongoing since 2011. The first phase addressed reserve water rights to several off-reservation tracts in the Bill Williams River Basin and resulted in the Bill Williams River Water Rights Settlement Act of 2014. The second phase, addressed in S-4104, covers additional water rights in the Bill Williams River Basin as well as the remainder of the tribe's water rights in the Colorado River Basin and the Verde River Basin. S-4104 would resolve the tribe's remaining water rights claims in Arizona, ratify and confirm the Wallapai Tribe Water Rights Settlements Agreement among the Wallapai Tribe, the United States, the State of Arizona, and others and authorize funds to implement the settlement agreement. The bill would reallocate 4,000 acre feet of fourth priority Central Arizona project, non-Indian agriculture priority water to the tribe to be used for any purpose on or off reservation within the lower Colorado River Basin in Arizona. S4104 establishes a trust fund of a 180 million that the tribe can use to develop water infrastructure on its reservation. It also authorizes a $5 million fund for the Secretary of the Interior for settlement implementation, including for ongoing groundwater mon monitoring and modeling. The department supports S4104. The bill is a result of over a decade of good faith negotiations. Rather than committing the tribe or the United States to construct specific water infrastructure projects, S4104 allows the tribe to make decisions regarding how, when, and where to develop water infrastructure on its reservation. This approach to settlement is consistent with tribal sovereignty and self-determination. Environmental compliance and issuance of a record of decision by the Secretary are conditions precedent to construction of tribal projects with the trust fund. 
The environmental compliance process will allow for the identification and mitigation of any adverse impacts of a project, including adverse impacts to the Grand Canyon National Park. Previously introduced bills to approve the settlement include provisions prohibiting the tribe and the United States from objecting to any use of groundwater outside the boundaries of the reservation. Recent negotiations have produced compromise language tailored to the new, unique facts in hydrogeology on and around the reservation. The department believes that S4104 would protect the groundwater resources available on the reservation while providing certainty to surrounding communities that also rely on the Truxton Aquifer. However, we caution that the compromises reached in this settlement are not a one-size-fit-all and should not be considered a precedent for other settlements. As a final matter, the department notes that S4104 contains restrictions on taking lands into trust in Arizona. This restriction is a significant limitation on the authority of the United States under existing federal law and is contrary to the administration's strong support for returning ancestral lands to tribes. The department does not seek to contradict the tribe's decision that the benefits provided by S4104 justify this compromise. The department supports the tribe's exercise of its sovereignty while strongly disfavoring restrictions on taking of lands into trust. The department is pleased to support S4104. S4439 would transfer approximately 1,031 acres of federal land in Siskiyou and Humboldt counties, California, from the United States Forest Service to the Department of the Interior and directs the secretary to take that land into trust for the benefit of the Karuk tribe. The transfer of the administrative jurisdiction and transfer into trust is subject to the condition that the Chief of the Forest Service continues to manage the national wild and scenic river system that flows through the Katamine and Amikiatam land. Additionally, the bill directs the Secretary of Agriculture to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Karuk tribe to establish mutual goals to protect and enhance the river values of any component of the national wild and scenic river system that flows through their land. Gaming on the land would be prohibited. The department supports this legislation. The Katamine and Amikiatam land is sacred to the Kuruk tribe and vital to their culture and traditions. We appreciate the difficulty and uncertainty the tribe faces in relying a special use permit for ceremonial access. The department strongly supports returning traditional and sacred lands back to tribes and supports agreements with Indian tribes to collaborate in co-stewardship of federal lands and waters under the jurisdiction of the Department of the Interior and Department of Agriculture. Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to provide the department's views on these important bills, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith, please proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, uh, Vice Chair Murkowski, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on H.R. 5221. H.R. 5221 would amend the Indian Health Care Improvement Act to establish an urban Indian organization confer policy for the Department of Health and Human Services. The bill would require the Department of Health and Human Services to ensure its agencies and offices confer with urban Indian organizations in carrying out laws relating to Indian health care. I'd like to first start off by underscoring the unique and political relationship we do have with Indian tribes before I move on to the, this bill in particular, because an integral component of the government to government relationship is our commitment to regular and meaningful consultation with federally recognized Indian tribes. The Department of Health and Human Services takes its responsibility to consult with tribal governments seriously and first established the department's tribal consultation policy in 1997. And this policy specifically establishes the unique political status of tribal governments and it is upon that status that the government to government relationship is affirmed through the HHS tribal consultation policy. The Indian Health Service tribal consultation policy was last updated on January 18th, 2006. And likewise, it was developed in consultation with Indian tribes and outlines that consultation with Indian tribes will occur to the extent practicable and permitted by law before any action is taken that will significantly affect Indian tribes. Other statutes and policies exist that allow for federal consultation with Indian organizations and confer with urban Indian organizations that by the nature of their business serve Indian people and might be affected if excluded from the consultation and confer process. 
As part of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, Congress reauthorized and amended the Indian Health Care Improvement Act and added a requirement that the Indian Health Service confer to the maximum extent practicable with urban Indian organizations in carrying out the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. In 2014, the Indian Health Service established its first policy on conferring with urban Indian organizations. The policy serves as a guide when the agency seeks input from urban Indian organization leaders on urban Indian health matters. The IHS Urban Confer Policy strives to ensure that urban Indian health care needs are considered at the local area and national levels when implementing and carrying out the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. The Indian Health Service Confer Policy has been used since its implementation to ensure that the highest possible health status for Indian, urban Indians occurs. The Indian Health Service is the only federal agency in federal government to implement this formal process, and it is a best practice and critical partnership opportunity. The Indian Health Service has consistently heard from urban Indian organizations through the confer process. They would like the opportunity to confer with other HHS operating divisions and staff offices. They have also expressed that the need to confer with other HHS agencies is even more critical due to the pandemic and need for interagency collaboration. The Indian Health Service conferring process works to ensure that healthcare priorities for urban Indian populations are being heard and addressed at the local area and national levels. We look forward to continuing our work with Congress on this bill and welcome the opportunity to provide technical assistance as requested by the committee or its members. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Clark, uh, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Schatz and Vice Chairman or Chairwoman Murkowski and members of the committee. I am Damon Clark, Chairman of the Wallapai Tribe. The Wallapai Tribe strongly supports S4104, the Wallapai Tribe Water Rights Settlement Act of 2022. The Wallapai Reservation encompasses approximately one million acres in the northwest in northwestern Arizona. The Colorado River, we call Hakama, forms a 108-mile northern boundary of the reservation through a portion of the Grand Canyon. Our reservation has no significant surface streams other than the Colorado River. It has very limited groundwater resources. The tribe's groundwater wells are being de depleted and well levels on the reservation have been dropping for years. The tribe's residential community at Peach Springs relies exclusi exclusively on three groundwater wells in the Truxton Aquifer near the reservation's southern border boundary. Those wells were installed in 1975. So the piping for the well system is 43 years old and has failed in the recent past, leaving our community without water for several days. One of the wells also has also su suffered episodes of dangerous E. coli contamination. We're very vulnerable to the short term interruptions in supply from these wells, and also to the long-term decline in the water levels in the aquifer. The situation is even worse elsewhere on the reservation. There are two wells at West Water, which has provided all the water for our tourist development 35 miles away at Grand Canyon West on the western rim of the Grand Canyon. But these, but th three years ago, those wells suddenly failed because of the drought. The collapse of these wells have forced us to limit our operations at Grand Canyon West, thus threatening our tribal economy and the main source of employment for our members. As an emergency measure, we have resorted to pumping more water from the Truxton Aquifer and hauling it 15 miles by truck on a gravel road to get to Grand Canyon West. The patchwork system is insecure and expensive but it is the only way that we can continue our remaining operations at Grand Canyon West. The Colorado River is the only feasible solution to these problems and the only water supply that can satisfy the long-term needs of our population living in Peach Springs and on the rest of our reservation. 
This settlement would give our tribe an allocation of 4,000 acre feet a, a year of Colorado River water and fun for funding for the pipeline system to deliver that water to the reservation in order to serve our needs at both Peach Springs and Grand Canyon West. Package of this legislation is essential for our tribe is to have secure future on our reservation. We have done everything possible to provide jobs and income to our people in order to lift them out of poverty, but the lack of secure water supply is a major obstacle we still face. This legislation would very much help us to overcome this obstacle. This legislation is strongly supported by the state of Arizona and other important state parties, including CAP, the Salt River Project, and it also has the support of our neighbor, Mojave County. Finally, for the first time, I'm very pleased that this legislation is supported by the Department of Interior and the Department of Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I will, please, I will be pleased to answer any questions you may have, and our tribe will help in any way we can to secure enactment of this critical legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Next, we have the Honorable Russell Buster Atterbury, Chairman of the Karuk Tribe, Happy Camp, California. Ayuki, hello. Chair Schatz, Ranking Member Morawski, Iotwa, thank you for inviting me here to testify on behalf of the Karuk Tribe. My name is Russell Buster Atterbury, I'm Tribal Chairman. Uh, our tribe is extremely grateful to Congressman Huffman, Senator Padilla, and Senator Feinstein for their partnership in this endeavor to return these sacred lands to the Karuk people. In Karuk language, these places are known as Kadamin and Ayuhich, our center of the world, Amikiyatam, our place for first salmon ceremony and world renewal ceremony, Aishkish, the Klamath River, and Masusa, the Salmon River. Our traditional ancestral homeland encompasses a vast remote territory of over 1 million acres in the mid-Klamath region of Northern California near the Oregon border. The seizing of these lands by the United States was done without the free prior informed consent of the Karuk tribe, nor did the establishment of the national force system specify its direct effects on our people. Our people have lived and conducted ceremonies on these sacred lands since time began. And the stewardship and management of these lands are vital to the preservation and continuation of Karuk culture language, religion, and identity. Many aspects of our ceremonies require isolation from any kind of human interaction. In recent years, we have seen a dramatic increase in disturbances from airplanes, helicopters, and recreational users. This legislation will provide our people protection from these types of negative and disrespectful occurrences. The tribe's historic and present day government to government relationships with the United States is due in large part to ceremonial leaders and families conducting ceremonies and rites on these lands. These areas are integral to understanding the Karuk creation stories, as well as the perpetuation of Karuk customs, language and culture. This legislation will also provide the Karuk tribe what other Americans have long had the right to do, which is freely exercise our religion on land that is sacred to us without free, free fear of outside disturbances, interference, or interruptions. Our Karuk legislative team has conducted exhaustive reach, outreach to educate stakeholders our tribal neighbors, local and state governments, the administration and Congress about this legislation and why it, was, it is so desperately needed. 
We have also facilitated productive internal discussions with critical ceremonial families and community members to ensure we have their support and their advocacy through this process of returning the center of the world to our people. To date, we have received no opposition to the Kadamine and Amikiyatam Sacred Lands Act. We look forward to working with Congress and the administration to have this bill enacted as quickly as possible and return these sacred lands to their original stewards. Yoatua, thank you to this committee for listening to my testimony that represents many years of advocacy on part of the Karuk Tribal Council, Karuk ceremonial leaders, and Karuk people who have waited far too long for this sacred place to be repatriated. Yoatua, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, we have Dr. Patrick Rock, the Chief Executive Officer of the Indian Health Board of Minneapolis in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Thank you, Chairman Schatz. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Dr. Patrick Rock. I'm a member of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. I serve as a CEO and uh, healthcare provider at the Indian Health Board in Minneapolis. We are also a member of the National Council of Urban Indian Health. Let me start by saying thank you for the opportunity to testify on a bipartisan Urban Indian Health Confer Act, H.R. 5221, which passed by an overwhelming majority of 406 votes last November. I would also like to applaud two leaders of this committee, Senators Tina Smith and James Langford, for their bipartisan introduction of the identical companion legislation, S-4323. This legislation would require agencies and offices within the Department of Health and Human Services to discuss important policies related to health care for urban Indians and with Indian health organizations. As a background, there, uh, through the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, the Indian Health Service has a legal obligation to confer with UIOs, which is an essential tool used to ensure access to health services for Native people. Unfortunately, HHS has interpreted it to mean that only IHS has the requirements to confer with UIOs. It is crucial to patient care that HHS and all agencies it operates establishes a formal conferred process. We would like to adhere to the phrase, no policies about us without us. A clear communication pathway between federal health agencies and UIOs is imperative especially during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic that has disproportionately impacted natives. This pandemic has demonstrated that a lack of, of a conferred policy uh, can result in missed opportunities for awareness and information provided to UIOs regarding native health care, which would otherwise be avoided through confer process. For instance, key information regarding vaccine distributions for the initial COVID-19 vaccine rollout was miscommunicated and created unnecessary hardship. HHS initially only directed tribal programs, which we are not considered to be, to choose a vaccine distribution program. And it was unclear if UIOs needed to decide between receiving vaccines through their state or, I, or IHS. In fact, due to the uncertainty around federal decisions, my clinic decided to receive vaccines through our state. However, many UIOs, unlike mine, ex experienced delayed rollout because the federal government was not prepared to distribute vaccines to, uh, through our clinics. At the House hearing on this bill, IHS confirmed on the record that a lack of conferred policy delayed patient access to vaccines. Urban Confer would also help with implementation of 100% federal medical assistance percentage for services provided to to Medicaid beneficiaries of UIOs. Last year, Congress authorized this for two years in, in the American Rescue Plan Act with the intent to increase financial resources for UIOs. But over a year later, our clinics are still not receiving any financial benefit from 100% FMAP through increased reimbursement rates. An urban, an, an urban conferred policy across HHS agencies, including CMS, would be instrumental in ensuring that obstacles relating to programs and benefits that directly affect UIOs are addressed quickly so UIOs are better equipped to provide health care to their patients. 
Support for urban confer is strong in Indian country. In fact, two years ago, the National Con Congress of American Indians passed a resolution calling for urban confer policy across HHS departments. It is important to note that urban confer policies do not supplant or otherwise impact tribal consultation uh, and the government-to-government -government relationship between tribes and federal agencies. Further, we have support from the administration and bipartisan support from Congress. As such, we urge swift passage of this bill to improve health care delivery to Native patients who do not reside on reservations. We must move past the notion that only IHS has a trust obligation to Native people, as the federal government as a whole has a responsibility to provide health care for all Native people. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important issue. I have provided written testimony to the committee. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I'll start the questions. Uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Frihagi, um, access to federal lands that contain tribal sacred sites uh, is an important exercise of the government to government relationship, but sometimes simple access is not enough, particularly for the Karuk tribe, which doesn't have a big land base. So how does this bill strike the appropriate balance between tribal and federal interests? Yeah, I think uh, the bill does strike a strong balance between the two. We think it's consistent with the joint secretarial order signed by the Secretaries of the Interior and Agriculture, uh, number 3403, which uh, sets the direction for co-stewardship, co-management between the tribes and land management agencies. Um, I think up front, it's also important to recognize that federal interest does include you know, the trust responsibilities of the tribes, including, including the sacred lands. And so uh, we take that into account, obviously, along with the important responsibilities of land management bureaus. And when you consider the sacred uh, land, the importance to the tribe, as Chairman Atterbury noted, that this is the center of their world. Um, and the bill then taking the step of um, ensuring that the wild and uh, scenic river components continue to be managed by the chief of the Forest Service allows for co-management. And then through the requirement of having an MOU with the Forest Service and the Karuk tribe, that allows them to make sure they're on the same wavelength to ensure that you have that appropriate balance. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Deputy Director Smith, um, you know Native Hawaiians receive health care through HHS uh, as a result of the, as an expression of the federal government's trust responsibility, but HHS doesn't have an official a consultation or confer policy that applies to Native Hawaiians at the moment. Do you need a statute in order to do that? Uh, thank you for the, the question, um, uh, Chair Schatz. Um, I, can, I can speak from the Indian Health Service and, and at the department, uh, department level with regard to the tribal consultation policy as it pertains to um, federally recognized Indian tribes. That's certainly a question that we could take back, but uh, through the... Well, but I mean, let, let's, be, let, let's be crisp here, right? Native Hawaiians don't have tribal recognition. Native Hawaiians are not currently pursuing tribal recognition. What we're saying is that under the trust responsibility, because there's money being pushed out, is there some way to get at conferring without having to hang your hook on a government-to-government -government relationship, but rather the trust relationship. Seems to me that you have the flexibility to express the idea, nothing about me without me, um, without having to try to make a square peg fit into a round hole. Correct. So it's similar to uh, what's at play with the proposed bill HR 5221, where uh, d d other operating divisions outside of the Indian Health Service do not have a specific legal requirement um, there's nothing preventing them from conferring, but there's not no requirement or policy that allows them to initiate uh, consult confer. They're not allowed to do it. Uh, there's nothing preventing them from doing that. There's nothing preventing them from doing it. Certainly. And then you say there's no statute that allows them to do it. That sounds like the lack of a statute prevents them from being able to do it. There. There's no statute to my knowledge that... Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that if an agency wants to confer, they can confer. And if using certain legal terms triggers a widespread freakout, we can use different words. But the point is, right, 
that to the extent that there's a trust responsibility, nothing about me without me. And the Biden administration, it seems to me, has a perfect legal right to express that through an internal memorandum, a new rule, um, a directive from the, de from the director of the department or one of the agencies. This is not, I, I think we're overcomplicating this. And I think there are a bunch of people who are going, gosh, they're not a tribe, so we can't. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is to the extent that there are agencies and organizations that receive funding from HHS, they should be consulted with. And I'm hoping we can work together on this. We're happy to work with you on it. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, final question for this round. Chairman Clark, uh, um, you've testified um, about the difficulties your tribe has encountered as a result of water shortages. How does this settlement help? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, this will help because on one side of the reservation, we have not even looked at. We, on the east side, and with the drought as we're looking at today, we are very, very short on water. Like I said earlier, our water on the, on the wells have depleted, and some uh, the wells also collapse. So now we're taking water from a fire hydrant, putting it in a truck, trucking it to another area for it to get out to Grand Canyon West. In the meantime, our, our community is suffering because we're taking water from the community to go out there. And if, a, if our water truck breaks down or has a flat, then we have to fix that. And again, we're... We're short on water because there's no water going out there. On the east side of the reservation, we haven't, I mean, we've talked about it, but we need to get water on the east side as well, not just on the west side in the community, but also on the east side. So this would really help. Thank you very much. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Clark, thank you for that. It sounds like a not an ideal situation as you're, as you're looking to literally truck water from a fire hydrant. Let me ask you, um, Mr. Fry Hoggy, <clears throat> the, the Wallopee tribe has been working on completing this water settlement for nearly a decade now. In, in 2016, I recall that the tribe and, it, and the state partner reached an agreement on phase two. The federal agencies at the time did not support it. Now we've got an agreement with the federal negotiating team and Interior is, is testifying in support of this. What, what happened? What, what transpired there in the settlement that in allowed Interior to, to now get behind the statement? I know, uh, I believe one of the factors was on uh, the looking a little more narrow, the, the focusing of the looking at the impacts of groundwater uses um, and how that could, the ability to, to narrow that so that we'd had a better surety about the, there would truly be wet water rights for the tribe. Um, at the end of the process, and I believe that was one of the critical factors. Um, the chairman asked you a, a question um, uh, about the, uh, the MOU bet between the Karak tribe. I raised the issue of Forest Service uh, in my opening. Um, your testimony states that the department supports agreements with Indian tribes to collaborate in the co-stewardship of federal waters under the jurisdiction of DOI and, and AG. Um, this is now, this legislation is directing the chief of the Forest Service and the tribe to enter into an MOU um, to protect uh, and enhance wild and scenic river systems, all done in cooperation with the tribe. So in addition to the MOUs, do you need any other tools um, to support the co-stewardship of, of lands and waters with the tribes? And just an example, I would raise is the 638 contracts uh, under ISDIA, under the Indian Self-Determination Act. They also promote co-stewardship. Um, is this something that could be helpful in this case? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think the, the more that other federal agencies beyond, especially Indian Affairs, IHS, uh, can use 638 contracting, uh, self-governance compacting mechanisms, it's a great tool to allow to engage in tribes and, and partnerships for co-stewardship, co-management. Um, another key factor is in our 2023 budget, we have a $14.8 million uh, funding request for uh, land acquisition for tribes. 
um, that could be a tool also where tribes could be uh, purchasing lands that end up with some joint strategies with federal agencies. Uh, a key part of that is funding. And then the other part is uh, to be able to do that, we need the, uh, there's a cert- currently an annual cap on land acquisition funding that goes back to the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act. So if we could get that lifted to at least the amount we're requesting, uh, plus the 638 contracting and OSG and self-governance compacting, those would be two significant steps forward. Okay. Okay. Um, y- it's been mentioned that that Interior, well, along with the rest of the, the, the government, has, of course, a, a, a trust responsibility to tribes. How How is the Department of Interior going to be involved in in upholding that trust responsibility as the tribe and Forest Service negotiate this MOU that's mandated under the, the legislation? Uh, I uh, hopefully I think because of the, the structure sort of set up in the Joint Secretary Order 3403 with Interior and Agriculture, it outlines a lot of the best practices and policies we can provide for continuing to engage as uh, with the tribe in our trust responsibility along with the Forest Service to ensure that that balance is found between the federal and tribal interests. So it would be consistently engaged. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, you you gave a, a pretty good uh, outline there um, uh, about this, this whole process uh, within HHS for tribal consultation and the development of the confer policy. I don't know that I actually heard you say whether or not you, whether HHS actually supports the bill. I think you said that you stand ready to provide uh, technical assistance, but what what is the position of, of HHS on uh, on um, HR five two 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 one? Yes, thank you very much for the the question. Yeah, in its declaration of national Indian health policy, Congress has specifically declared that it's the policy of the nation to ensure the highest possible health status for Indians and urban Indians. And the Department of Health and Human Services is committed to working with Indian and urban Indian communities to meet this policy. However, as I mentioned, only the Indian Health Service has a legal obligation to confer with urban Indian organizations. And we're the only agency within HHS and federal government at this time that has implemented a formal um, confer process. So at this time, I cannot speak for our departmental colleagues, but what what I can tell you is that we have found the process to be successful and beneficial we're happy to provide technical assistance to you. I think that's kind of maybe a soft support. They think it's going to work. Actually, you know it can work. Um, uh, I'm going to mark that down as a maybe. Um, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. Let's follow up together. Sure. Senator Smith. Thank you. I appreciate your question, Senator Murkowski, and your um, your response as well, Senator Schatz. Um, Mr. Smith, um, and I'll, I'll just say, I'll just say that we have been working with the Department of Health and Human Services for a long time trying to get a definitive, yes, we support this, and we have so far been unsuccessful in getting that. However, we have, um, I think, testimony today that um, that was that spoke to the power of consultation with urban indigenous communities, and um, I think that it is an obvious um, next step that that uh, confer process with other parts of the department and human services would also be useful and um, and valuable. And so, um, I would just, Mr. Smith. Um, ask as you return to the Department of Health and Human Services that you tell them that we are um, eager to work with the department and we would appreciate it if we could get um, speedy responses and, and, and fast technical support so that we can understand if there are any issues with the legislation so that we can resolve them in order to move it forward. Would, will you make that commitment to me? Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. I absolutely will take that back and uh, coordinate. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, Let me go to uh, Dr. Rock, if I may. I'm so grateful to you for joining us today, and I think you're in a great position to help us to understand some of the issues that urban indigenous um, um, organizations have had that could be resolved by this kind of confer process. So um, one example that comes to mind, um, Dr. Rock, is that is a Um, um, an issue um, around data sharing. So uh, Senator Murkowski and I actually have a piece of legislation, um, the urban Indian health, um, 
that, that, that excuse me, let me, I got that wrong. We, we have a piece of legislation that would, that would get at making sure that the Department of Health and Human Services is sharing public health data with epidemiology centers, tribal epidemiology centers, urban indigenous organizations. Um, Dr. Rock, could you just tell us how this kind of public data sharing um, with the CDC, for example, would help you in the work that you're doing? Certainly, it um, it would help at multiple levels. Uh, I think you know, take for example with uh, ARC, uh, you know, uh, with research and patient safety, uh, those are areas that I think we, uh, you know, could make a lot of strides, especially with uh, folks like CDC uh, with vaccine distribution and right. and things like CARES appropriations um, pieces, uh, and also including things like. Um, uh, uh, missing and in, in, uh, murdered indigenous uh, people. Uh, that's something, you know, data is, is key to uh, start addressing some of these issues, especially folks like uh, out in Seattle with UIHI and the, the, Epi, uh, the epicenter there. And so having um, transparent and free flow of information helps all of our urban Indian health organizations. We are really in a key uh a key place to address some of these issues. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that um, I completely agree with you. You raised in your testimony the issue of um, um, the issue of the 100% FMAP policy, and we worked hard in uh, the American Rescue Plan to deliver $84 million in direct funds and two years of 100% federal medical assistance percentage for services to urban indigenous um, organizations, and yet we know that there have been issues with implementation that I think have affected UIOs in every state. Dr. Rock, can you just let us know a little bit about what that looks like in Minnesota and how appropriate consultation um, might have made this um, problem a lot easier to resolve. Certainly. Thank you, Senator. Uh, so, in fact, about over 20 years of my time yes. have been focused on this issue of 100% FMAP, uh, at least bringing payment parity to uh, urban Indian health organizations, especially during a time of COVID. Uh, and for the last 15 months, um, oh, since the FMAP provisions were enacted, um, we, of course, have been working uh, with uh, Senator Smith's office, uh, as well as our, our governor's office, uh, on how to make this a reality. Uh, unfortunately, we have yet to see um, really any type of activity or actually reimbursement occur uh, utilizing the 100% AFMAP uh, through the federal system, uh, which is extremely, extremely disappointing, I need to tell you. Uh, we continue to, to seek out uh, solutions uh, moving forward, but I think we're going to need help uh, with our state partners as well as our federal partners, including CMS. Uh, this would be a point, an important point to have access and conferring with CMS. Thank you. Also. And I, I know that um, you all are not alone in having that challenge with um, FMAP reimbursement. And again, if there had been good consultation across all of Department of Health and Human Services, that I think um, would have been easier to resolve on issues of data sharing, 100% FMAP, I would say also federally qualified health center issues, all of those would be easier to resolve if we had good, um, the kind of consultation that our bill would, um, would require. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Smith. Senator Hoven, are you ready for your questions? We'll be in just a minute. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Did you need me to stall for a, a moment? Yeah, for like 30 seconds. Just, you know, kind of survey the terrain here. No, we're good. Senator Hoven. Thank, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to witnesses. Uh, for uh, Deputy Director Smith, um, the Urban Health uh, Urban Indian Health Center Act requires the Department of Health and Human Services to confer with uh, urban Indian organizations. So does HHS and its agencies and uh, offices currently confer with urban Indian organizations on an informal basis? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Hoven. Um, as, as I just mentioned right now, or, or previously, um, at, at this time, the Indian Health Service is the only federal agency that has the legal obligation to confer with urban Indian organizations. 
and as such is the only uh, federal agency within the department that has a formal uh, policy and process. But ha having said that, there have been instances where the Indian Health Service has um, initiated urban confer on behalf of other um, uh, federal uh, agencies within the department in, in uh, seeking input on, on their behalf. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Well, I'm wondering what impact formal consultation, you know, would have between HHS and urban Indian organizations. So, I mean, let's talk about how that's going to change and, and the fact that it goes from informal to formal and, and you know, how you think that affects things. Uh, what I can share with you from the Indian Health Service experience is certainly by developing a policy, well, first by, by having uh, conferred, defined in statute, uh, which the Indian Health Care um, Improvement Act does, it defines uh, confer as, as um, uh, the, a form of communication uh, that emphasizes trust, respect, and shared responsibility and open exchange of opinions. So that means that two entities are going to be listening to each other and how they're gonna listen. Uh, we further developed policy around establishing what we're gonna talk about. So what you'd find in our policy is a critical event. And to give you an example, uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, uh, Congress provided several supplemental um, uh, packages that required funding decisions that had a huge impact on urban Indian organizations. And so we engaged in our policy in, um, in, in uh, invoking our uh, policy to confer with urban Indian organizations to solicit their input uh, prior to making those funding decisions. And uh, we believe that that did have an impact um, on the manner in which we made those decisions. Do you have other examples? An another example, one that's actually occurring right now, and, and we are very thankful to uh, uh, the members of the Senate that signed a letter uh, to the uh, Biden administration earlier this year uh, requesting that the agent that the administration consider the formation of an urban interagency uh, 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 work group. Uh, certainly uh, that made its way down through the department and in May uh, we sent a letter uh, through uh, our acting director Ms. Fowler to Senator Padilla saying that we would initiate urban confer to look at an exploration of an urban interagency task force on behalf of, of, of government. And so just uh, recently, uh, earlier this month, we held our first um, urban confer session to hear directly from urban Indian organizations on what that would look like. And so we're actively in that process and uh, we'll look to uh, going through our process to see what comes from the exploration of that idea of formulating an interagency uh, workforce dedicated to urban Indian organizations. So then you think that setting that up as a formal process through legislation like this would strengthen that process and be a benefit? Um, any other thoughts on it? What we've experienced through the Indian Health Service again is that it really helps to identify uh, critical issues and necessary input at the area, local and national levels on uh, what is deemed as a critical um, event, whether it's uh, a budget uh, policy issue or those items that are outlined in our policy. And we're happy to provide additional uh, technical assistance to you on this matter. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hoven. If there are no more questions for our witnesses, members may also submit follow-up written questions for the record. The hearing record will be open for two weeks. I want to thank all of the witnesses for their time and their testimony. This hearing is adjourned.